so much for, for coming to Liquid today. I know there's a lot of other stuff going on this evening. Uh, my name is Lisa Crew, and um, the festival started Thursday. It runs through October 23rd. The full schedule is at liquid.org. And do note that some events are online, some events are live, and some events require advanced registration. Um, so please take a look and flood out your next two weeks. Uh, today we're honored to be able to present World Rebuilding the Art of the Novel, moderated by novelist Naomi Minawira, and featuring four excellent novels who I will um, introduce in just a second. I just want to say a special thanks to the Contemporary Jewish Museum. I think you all received a ticket when you came in. You, should, you can go check out what's going on at the rest of the museum with that ticket. Um, I'd also like to thank the Yerba Buena Community Benefit District um, and the California College of the Arts for helping make this event possible. And we have many other sponsors, including the city and county of San Francisco, and you can check out our website to find out more about that. Um, I think that you were all given a, a survey at the door. Please do fill those out. It helps us know what our audience is, what our audience wants to see more of, etc. And we also ask you to support Liquid if you can. Uh, most of our events are free, and we've been um, you know, putting on events like the Lit Crawl for free for decades. And if you want to keep us as part of San Francisco's cultural landscape, please consider donating. You can Venmo us at Litquake, at PayPal, we're at info at litquake.org, or you can just go to the website, litquake.org. So today we're going to be hearing from the panel for about an hour, and then we're going to have an audience Q&A. I will moderate that. When you ask a question, please stand up. I'll remind you. Um, and if you have a quiet voice, I can uh, restate the question for you, since we don't have a a wireless mic. Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists from the far end, as, as far as where I'm standing. So, um, and I think you guys are kind of like, you're actually in alphabetical order. <laughs> so that's pretty helpful. <laughs> um, so, um, New York Times bestselling author Carol Edgarian's novels include Vera, Three Stages of Amazement, and the international bestseller Rise, The Euphrates. Her essays and articles regularly appear in national magazines and anthologies, and she is the co-editor of The Writer's Life, Intimate Thoughts on Work, Love, Inspiration, and Fame. She's the co-founder and editor of Narrative and Narrative in the Schools, and she lives here in San Francisco. Next, the next closest to me, is Rebecca Handler. She's a writer who also lives and works in San Francisco. Her stories have been published and awarded in several anthologies, and she blogs regularly at onewomanparty.com. Evie Richter is not alone, it is her debut novel, and is a starred uh, review, um, and, and Kirkus wrote, a tragic comic exploration of the collateral damage of Alzheimer's disease. Handler gets it right from the title on out, Edie is definitely not alone. Next author is Yang Huang. She grew up in China and has lived in the United States since 1990. Her novel, My Good Son, won the University of New Orleans Publishing Lab Prize. Her late story in the collection, My Old Faithful, won the Juniper Prize. And her debut novel, Living Treasures, won the Nautilus Book Award Silver Medal. She works for the University of California, Berkeley, where I work, too. So oh. we, I think we said we'd have lunch, so yes. I guess we really have to do that. <laughs> um, and she lives in the Bay Area. Um, and then next to um, Yang is the, our moderator today, Naomi Munawira, is the award-winning writer of the novels Island of a Thousand Mirrors and What Lies Between Us. She is widely published in the Huffington Post raved Moonwear's prose is visceral and indelible, devastatingly beautiful, reminiscent of the glorious writings of Louise Erdrich, Amy Tan, and Alice Hawker, who also find ways to truth tell through fiction. She lives in Oakland, next to me. I live across the street from Oakland. Nice. Um, and is finishing her third novel, a psychosexual literary thriller. And then closest to me here, get out of the way, is um, Ashley Nelson. She received her MFA from Columbia, where she was awarded the Clen, is that, how do you pronounce the Clen Lemon? Clen. Yeah. Um, Esperanza Fellowship. Her work has been a notable mention in the Best American Non-Required Reading, and she's the recipient of the Bambi Holmes Award for Emerging Writers. In 2015, she co-founded Transit Books, an independent publishing house with a focus on international literature. Immediate Family is her first book. Thank you again for coming, and thanks to the authors for participating, and I will turn it over to Naomi. Great. 
Um, hi, everyone. It is so strange not to see you on tiny screens. <laughs> I'm like, oh, OK. You're um, here in person. Um, I just want to say, for me, this is my first time on stage in two years. I think that's true for some of us. Mm -hmm. um, and these writers have had the really strange experience of having debut books out during a pandemic, which is crazy. So, you know, just give them a big round of applause before we start. It's a difficult thing to have a launch at any time and to have a launch during a global <clears throat> pandemic, I can't even imagine. So um, I'm really happy to be here with all of them. I've spent the last weeks uh, or months looking closely at their books, like really getting in there. It's been a really wonderful pleasure. Um, and I'm also like really happy to be here with Litquake. I've been reading with Litquake for 12 years? A million. A million, a million years. Liquid is amazing. I'm so happy to be part of this very robust and live literary conversation that we have in this city. Um, and so yeah, I'm going to just jump into it. I have questions for each of the writers to start with. Um, I'm sorry, my first question is actually for everyone, and then we'll go one by one. Um, and this is for anyone. In an interview, Rebecca. You've said that when people asked you what your debut novel would be about, you said secret keeping. <laughs> and it strikes me that all books are about secrets. Who knows what, when, when, what the author knows, when the reader knows something, and when the character knows something. Um, so my first question is, can each of you speak to how secret keeping works in your work? Hmm. Are we going in a line? No. <laughs> I can go first. Um, first of all, hello everyone, and good to be at the Jewish Contemporary Museum um, with Lit Quick. Yes, I, I do believe that secret keeping and how information is put out there is in, an important part in every novel, and I had a lot of fun with this book figuring out who knows what when. Oops. Um, my novel, Edie Richter is Not Alone, is about a woman who um, is harboring a pretty dark secret. You learn that, you learn the secret, secret early on in the novel, and so the book is not really uh, about sort of what's going on, when it will be revealed. You sort of learn it early, but it's more about the process of the secret, like eating her up inside and seeing, you know, the aftermath of this. Um, I don't know, I, I find that the topic of secret keeping is really universal. Um, we've all held secrets before, and I've always loved reading books with characters who are hiding things from each other. I think it's like one of the most fun ways to get into a book. Um, but yeah, I don't know, do you wanna to speak to it at all? Anyone? Yeah, do I need to, should I pull this? Oh, leave it. So, oh, leave it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Carol. Um, this is my book. I feel like I didn't hold up my book. Um, so, so Vera, um, the, the main character of my novel, is a secret. Um, she's the daughter of the most successful madam on the Barbary Coast in 1906. And instead of being raised by her mother, she's being raised by a foster mother. And so her whole identity and family and origin um, is something that can never be discussed. And yet when the 1906 earthquake and fire happens, all that goes, all that goes to bust. And um, I think secrets, you know, so much of, of what we write about in fiction is what's said and of course what isn't said. And that's so much of the engine of any of any novel. All all the things that that should be said and can't be said, or when they're finally said, they sound differently than the characters would ever imagine, um, and they have different results because of that. So um, secret keeping is, thank God, we we keep secrets. Otherwise, what would we write about? <laughs> Should we put it back? So it's yeah. 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 Okay, okay, we won't move it again. <laughs> First of all, I, I'd like to echo Naomi, uh, everyone, that I'm really honored to be here. I feel very safe and happy to uh, 
see all your beautiful faces. Um, I think um, one of the motivations for secret keeping is that um, characters desire. You, my good son, um, characters want certain things, but they don't want to encounter opposition or be judged for the choices, so they keep secrets. For example, the father wants his son to become engineer. Like most parents, he wants a better life for his son uh, than the one he had. But his son um, doesn't, you know, he just wants to get away from his parents and live his own life. So he uh, rebels by keeping a secret affair. Of course, all these secrets escalate and culminate in crisis that end in a unplanned pregnancy, a college quest, and a gay man's yearning for his father's acceptance. And I think uh, Arthur has an interesting role in this um, secret keeping. <laughs> uh, I decided to stay with Mrs. High's perspective. And uh, clearly, everyone's scheming behind his back. So I think Arthur is kind of all seeing, but not all knowing. Otherwise, the story can become a little uh, predictable. The characters are obedient like puppets. Instead, the, um, the author can make the, give the character agency by making them strong and real, not in the sense that they actually exist in the world, but they can stand on their own feet, make trouble, and complicate the story. So I was very happy that my characters um, surprised me with the uh, rebellious acts. <laughs> Also, just want to echo. So nice to be here. I can't believe this is a live event. I'm still <laughs> still in shock <laughs> to see you. Um, I often talk about with friends and readers and fellow writers. You know, what is the kind of book that you just cannot resist when you pick up? It has kind of a, a key word or a key theme, and you're like, "Yep, I'm sold." And we've someone had mentioned stories with runaways and other things, but for me, it's it's definitely a, any type of confessional. So anytime, especially you can have a, a female narrator on, in the opening pages say, I, I have something I need to get off my chest. I'm like, where do I sign? Where do I sign? <laughs> um, and so I think consequence, consequently, my, this novel is also a confessional of sorts and full of secrets. Um, it is about a, a woman who's been asked, it's her brother's wedding day, and she's been asked to give a, a speech about their life together. And as she's kind of thinking about and preparing what to say and, and how to kind of put words to their love and their life together, this second thread starts to quickly find its way into the story, a kind of confessional about the things that she's kept with him in her recent struggles with infertility. And I think that that, that kind of interest or curiosity in, in a confessional is also how the book found its form as a second person address. So it's addressed as a letter, a really intimate letter to her brother. And I think even something in that form really lends itself to that kind of intimacy to the things that are often are hard to speak about or become unspeakable um, between people in the ways that a letter can either be um, an act of courage in, in finally getting those things out or maybe an act of cowardice and that they never actually get but maybe the letter doesn't get delivered. Um, so yes, secret keeping is, is big on my list too. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, so this question is for Carol. It's really interesting reading your book and being in San Francisco. Um, Vera is about the 1906 earthquake and fire that destroyed the city. So it's, it's in, so intimate to be sitting here talking about it. Um, Carol, your fantastic novel taught me so much about the 1906 earthquake, and more importantly, the fire that swept through the city. Um, what was it like to do what I assume is painstaking research and render all of that into prose? And then I love that you included some historical characters. I'm thinking of Alma Spectrals. Um, could you talk to how you chose to include them? Sure. Um, is, this, does, is this OK? I should have said too, I, I can't believe I'm seeing real faces. It's, it's, just, it's very weird. It's wonderful. It's so wonderful. It's like you do these Zoom events and it's sort of like, did the tree really fall in the um, So I'd always been fixated on the 06 quake. I came out 
to San Francisco years, decades ago. And this place is real. I've now written two novels set in San Francisco, so certainly it beguiles me. But I was fascinated by this notion of, in a moment, within 45 seconds, a society could collapse. And then, of course, there were three days of fire. And I collected books on it. But it wasn't until the lead up to the 2016 election when it seemed to me our society was collapsing. Our, the, the norms that were, that were given were really being crushed that it seemed like, okay, to talk about what was going on but to do it in a different setting, I could really be unfettered. And what was happening in the 1906 quake, the morning of the quake, the mayor of the town, Eugene Schmitz, was about to be indicted. The city was riddled with corruption. Um, everybody, the board of supervisors, the sheriff, the mayor, were all bought by a guy named Abe Ruff, who was a really canny lawyer. And so um, I'm always drawn to like those moments when society is at, is at a, in crisis, um, when there's some political aspect and when there's a character or characters who are challenging the norms and are in some way um, dealing with a topic that um, seems to me such an American problem, and that is displacement. So the earthquake and fire gave me all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But there was so much history. I mean, it, you know, um, the San Francisco Museum, all the, the libraries, there's so much stuff online and first-hand accounts and photographs of, of, of how people survived. And I finished the book in January of 2020, never imagining that we were about to hit our own def, you know, defining crisis. Because one of, the, one, of the, one of the questions that really propelled me was like, what would you do? Who are you in a crisis? How do you show up for other people? How do you use that moment? to redefine the boxes society puts people in. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of what moved me in the novel, never anticipating that here we are in our own moment. Thank you. Um, Yang, your beautiful book takes on events that happened within a family in China during the time of Tiananmen Square protests. What made you choose that time and place? And then two, you're taking a close look at what happens in a family dealing with the rigors of a Chinese educational system. Can you tell us about how all of that works together? Like your book, mine also deals with historical events. Um, it was perhaps a simpler and more hopeful time. In the late 80s, technological and economic reforms swept across China. Along with the progress came with a fierce competition for limited seats at the universities. And the university students regarded themselves as intellectual elites. They aspired for democratic ideals and political reform. Tragically, um, Tiananmen Square massacre put an end to the protests and drove the movement underground where it remains censored to this day. Of course, Mr. Tai is far too preoccupied with son to be preoccupied him, uh, to concern himself with politics, but he's aware of the lack of personal choice and the tyranny of mediocrity, meritocracy in China. So he turns to Jude, American expat, in desperation because he thinks his son is a failure, but a father cannot give up on his son. Jude brings a prospect of a larger world, but his world has his own set of problems. So these people have some common ground, and the play field is leveled for them to have, um, to make, uh, for them to each make some contribution, help the other. Thanks. Thanks, Yang. Um, Ashley, 
your book, as you told us, but I will um, reiterate it, is uh, your brilliant book is narrated in the voice of a woman attempting to write a wedding speech for her brother who was adopted from Th Thailand into her white family in their childhoods. And I love that you included these long meditations on adoption in both history and literature. Can you tell us about the particular difficulties of writing this narrator and the way that your book might fit into the legacy of adoption literature? Yeah, I, I really love this question and I feel like there are kind of two questions in there. So I'll start with the first. Um, so in terms of the, I think the difficulty in writing into her, there's through, through many drafts and, and years of writing this book, I realized that the kind of driving force of the narrator is this, or of the book is this ambivalence on the narrator's part. She is both really resistant to tell the story because of inevitable power structures that are in place. She's the white older sister, she's the biological child, and she's also just very conscious of um, the kind of transitional space or the the boundaries of appropriation when it comes to the ownership of stories and when the line starts for one and ends and, and how that even changes when you're, you're talking about your own family member. So there's a resistance there, but she's also re really compelled to tell the story because, in, in part because her brother has asked her to. It's his wedding day and he, wa he wants her to say something kind and brilliant about him. Um, and she loves him and she realizes the more that she as the book is really centering her story when all is said and done, she realizes she can't really speak to the story of her life at all without having him in it. Their stories are inextricably linked. And so this question of perspective um, and how, who tells the story alters and defines its shape becomes a kind of driving uh, question and obsession of the book. And she says in the beginning, the end of the opening section, um, you know, what, what did I know about what facts should be collected or shed in the story of a person? What right did I have to speak of your life? And she spends the, the rest of the book kind of circling around this question. So I, I think that ambivalence drove it a lot of the difficulty in, in that story and the per perspective from which it's being told. Um, and then I love the second part of that question. I think what was really important for me as I was writing it is I, I I really was interested in the singular story of this family, but I also wanted her to constantly be kind of holding up their family story against different adoption narratives and frameworks. And she does this in a couple of ways. She looks at the historical framework, so kind of the history of transracial adoption in America and where her family falls into those timelines and, and that context. Um, institutional framing, so the kind of narratives that are often presented by adoption agencies to families and, and where she, the ways in which these narratives are often really surface level and reductive and the ways which she's also seen kind of the, the faint shape of her own family stories and mythologies kind of picking up these threads from that paperwork. And then the last piece is this literary framing, which is probably the, one of the most interesting parts of the book to write. So she's looking at um, the way that the adoption plot has traditionally been represented in literature and starts to become really interested in the ways, again, which her family either falls in and out of these kind of two tropes that she notices, uh, particularly with the Victorians, because they're all obsessed about writing about adoption. Um, Dickens, Trollope, Eliot, Austin. And she notices these kinds of two paths for the novel. Uh, one is in which the adoptee comes in and saves and restores a family, a family that's often doesn't have biological children or the biological children are terrible, or the opposite, an adoptee will come in to kind of create chaos and destruction. And so I think in many ways she's also in the novel offering kind of a third path, which is a house that's in a, in a constant kind of cycle of both of those things and, and restoration and destruction and the ways in which she, she sees again their lives reflected in these tropes and the ways in which they absolutely don't fit. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't think of Wuthering Heights as a story about adoption, and you really like made me rethink that. That was amazing. Yeah, Heathcliff is a really, um, probably one of the most interesting fictional adoptees I've read, um, especially in the way that he is, uh, he's foreignized. I mean, they, this is so much of kind of the racist language behind Wuthering Heights. He's, he's marked as dark and other, and, and in that way, it's kind of what makes him an ominous figure coming into the house. So it was especially interesting in those ways and thinking about kind of the way that adoptees are also um, these 
kind of narratives around the feral or the primitive adoptee when they come from someplace else into a white family. Yeah, thank you. Um, Rebecca, I don't have a copy of your book, so you might hold up your own book. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and this is sort of a return to the first question, but I think it's an important one for your book. Um, your book, your stunning novel, revolves around a singular character with a giant secret. And I've had to do this with my own second novel. It's like, how do you talk about the book without spilling the secret, that very pivotal piece of it? Yeah. Um, when I give a synopsis of the book, I usually say, that it is about a woman who is grieving after the death of her father, who had Alzheimer's for many years. Um, and she moves from San Francisco to Perth, Western Australia, which is otherwise known as the most remote city in the world, um, hoping that you know that sort of remote landscape will um, help her in her grief. But instead, it helps to uh, come to terms with this big secret that she has. Um, in reviews, I don't know if um, a lot of people in the room read book reviews, but I find that I'm, I'm nervous to read them if I haven't already read the book, because sometimes it'll give too much away. It's like I don't want to see a movie trailer sometimes if I'm really excited about the movie. Um, like Sally Rooney's new novel, I'm avoiding all book reviews until I read it. So. But um, so in, in some of the reviews for the book, they actually kind of say the secret straight up front. So I've had to tell people like, don't read it. But I also understand because it's like, you know, 30 or 40 pages in, you understand what she's carrying with her. And that's sort of not the objective of the book is to, you know, to hide the secret. It's, it's, as I mentioned before, I'm really interested in, you know, aftermath and how that operates in fiction. Um, so it is, it's funny when you write a book and then you need to talk about it. I've had, um, I, because I feel like I do need to sort of withhold a bit of information when I speak about the book. Um, but then I've done, one thing that's been really fun during um, this whole Zoom land is getting to attend book clubs. So with people who've actually read the whole book. And so I've, I've Zoomed in on, and so if any of you actually read this book for your book club, feel free to reach out to me and if you know schedule permits I can jump in and join you guys because that's fun to talk to readers after they've read it and then we can really like dig in to you know every secret not just the big secret but like the other ones along the way um, and yeah but it's funny I don't know if you guys feel that way about like you know you write this book and then you you talk about secret keeping it's like you need to look at the whole plot and decide like what you're going to divulge straight up and what you're gonna hide so Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a fun process. It is. Um, and Rebecca, a follow-up question. You've been really open about your own secret that you've been keeping mm -hmm. at the start of promoting your novel. Could you speak to that? Yes. And Naomi asked me before this if, if I wanted to talk about this crazy year and what a year it's been. Um, you might notice that I am without hair at the moment, and that is because I was diagnosed with cancer one month before my book came out. So not only, I'm okay though, uh, I will be okay. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, yes, I just finished chemo last week. So. Hot damn. Yay. Um, but yeah, so as if this pandemic wasn't terrible enough, I had to also receive a cancer diagnosis. So. As I was um, preparing for all of these Zoom events, which ended up actually really working in my favor this year, um, so that was sort of an interesting development. I, um, yeah, like a month before the book came out, I was given this huge blow. And this is my first novel, and I was really excited about promoting it. And I'm also kind of like holding this, my own secret of like this cancer diagnosis and scheduling cancer appointments and surgeries and treatments and everything as I'm talking about this book about secret keeping. So at the beginning it was completely wild and I just kind of, it was, I mean, for better or for worse, I am and quite an outstanding uh, compartmentalizer as it turns out. I was able to sort of jump into book land, talk about the book, and then when the Zoom event was over, like deal with cancer appointments and everything. But then it came to a point where I thought, let's actually talk about it. Like, because cancer is something that affects 
every single person in this room, whether it's yourself or a family member or unfortunately it's so ubiquitous, but also in the way that it's sort of woven into this book and it's, it's, it just became this, this real trip about like, um, you know, life imitating art and I, I've just, this, this year has been like some real, real ups and some real lows for me, so. Um, but thank you for, yeah, Naomi asked, do you want to, do you want to talk about it at all? And I'm, I'm happy to talk about it because it's an important issue and we're all real people going through really hard things. So, yeah. but yeah, but I will be okay. Thank you. <laughs> she has an amazing blog called One Woman Party, which is also the best name of a blog ever. So um, <laughs> go and true. read that that's amazing yeah if you want to hear about like the juicy ins and outs of um, cancer treatments with with some humor definitely <laughs> check it out yeah. um, and there's a question for everyone someone I don't remember who said you need great stillness to write a novel is it true great stillness you need great stillness to write a novel my question is is it true well, I have a a two-year-old at home, so I'm hearing that and thinking, I hope not, <laughs> if I ever want to write again. Um, but I think I, I'm curious, I'm always curious to how long writers work on these books. I mean, mine is particularly thin, so I think it gives the nice illusion that maybe I whipped through it quickly. But I think part of that stillness is, is yeah, a, a patience um, and, and a waiting that takes time and, and the process and the craft. So I, I think that's definitely true. Oh, that's a great um, follow-up question. How long did it take? For just for everyone, when you're, how long did this book take you? Uh, probably uh, about, I say about seven years. Oh, I, I have no idea what it would be like to have a still life. And I think <laughs> I don't. I, I particularly the women writers I know, um, I think stillness is hard to come by. I, I, uh, I think you have to create your stillness. So if it's moments, the other day my, um, uh, my daughter who's in college said to me that, that she had always gone to sleep at night when she was little, she, um, hearing me go clickety-clack, clickety-clack on the, on, the, on the laptop because the minute the kids went to sleep, I started writing because um, I've always had a day job too. Um, I think what I would say to sort of amend that is what you need is to, if there's volumes in your life, you, you, at a certain point in the novel when it really gathers steam, the novel takes over and um, becomes, those characters become in some ways more real than the people <laughs> in your life. Um, or they have, they have their own life, so you need to, it, it, the best circumstance is if, if is if your life is kind of boring, so so the writing and when you're when you're literally at the desk. I don't know if you all find this, mm. or even when you're not. When you're, um, I remember one time I was picking up my kids when they were young, and a friend of mine said that um, this woman had asked her if I was really weird because she saw me in the carpool line talking to myself, and I was like, <laughs> I was writing dialogue. You know, I was still working. Um, but this book took seven years, six and a half years. My last book took ten years, so a um, long time. Mm -hmm. I feel like I, I don't know, I have mixed feelings about the stillness because I'm really missing um, writing. I love to write in um, cafes and at libraries, mm -hmm. and I'm missing that a lot. I, I went back last week for the first time to this cafe where I hadn't been um, since the pandemic started, and uh, it was weird. You know, it's like it's everything's sort of different now. And and um, would I prefer to sit alone in a room without a mask, um, you know, sneezing all over myself by myself, or do I want to be out in public um, with my mask, trying to write? Um, I I don't know. I feel like I need a little bit of buzzing to write. Um, I mean, certainly there are times in the book and. There are, um, uh, the, the character Edie Richter has um, a couple of meltdowns, if you will. Um, and when I was sort of getting in a, like a real emotional space, then I would need to be really, really still when I was trying to sort of almost become her and write, write from her 
um, sort of panic mode, then I would need everything quiet around me. But in general, I like a little bit of buzzing. I like a little bit of um, like witnessing to my work. Um, like I'm less likely to, you know, go on social media and like read every crazy article about COVID and stuff. Like when there's people around watching me, I feel like a responsibility. Like I am a writer, I must <laughs> continue writing. Um, so I actually like a little bit of noise. I don't know. And this, um, this novel, the first, um, as Anne Lamott would say, very shitty draft. Um, the first draft took a year and then, um, but that was in, I think, 2016. So then I sort of, uh, you know, improved it, improved it, improved it. So I, I guess, I guess you would say maybe three or four years, but not um, all the time. So I would say like, I, yeah, first draft took a year, but I'm glad that that is not the version you will be reading. <laughs> <laughs> As you could probably tell, that stillness is relative, you know, for different writers and even yeah. for every writer. Uh, I have a day job. I work as an engineer, so um, on my, during my work days, I run around to fix computers. <laughs> <laughs> my writer persona is different from my uh, real-life persona. In real life, I'm very conscientious. I multitask and set priorities and deliver results on time. But on the weekends, I go to my cave. It's just a desk behind the closed door. I try to sit for long hours, if I can. <laughs> it's hard when you have kids. Um, I try to make my body still and my mind quiet so I can enter a mental space where imaginary characters can come on play. This book didn't take that long, it took like two, three years to write, but um, it was an earlier time when I was less busy. My uh, later books took a lot longer. Thank you, guys. Um, next question, what advice would you give to someone who is in the midst of writing a novel? Is that anybody here? <laughs> yeah, is anyone right? Are there any writers? In the I'm room? sure, yeah, cool. I'm sure, Hi. yeah, there we go. Keep Sorry? Unpublished. Uh, yet. Yet. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I don't I think a writer's a writer. I don't think yeah. published versus unpublished. I mean, if you like to write, keep writing. And I think uh, one difference maybe between published writers is that they finish their books. <laughs> like, I don't know, I would say keep keep going, you know, keep going. And and um, and then when you get to the point of if you're interested in trying to sell anything you write, um, keep going and be really comfortable with rejection because it's oftentimes not personal at all. Um, there's a whole business out there that uh, we don't really need to fully understand. You just try your hardest. Yeah, keep going and, and finish something. I think some people like keep plugging away and pounding on the same paragraph over and over and over and over and over. <laughs> and I would say just get, yeah, just get something on paper. Um, but, yeah. I, um, I just finished a really wonderful book by Marguerite Dura um, mm. called Practicalities, and they're not quite essays. They're, they're kind of logged conversations that she's had with a friend, and there's a lot on there about writing, but I, I really liked something she said. Um, she said that writing is a, a matter of de deciphering something that's already there. Um, and that it's not, it's not a transformation, it's not a matter of moving from one state to another, it's, it's something that already lives out in the darkness and it's work that you're doing as you're sleeping and as you're not still and doing all sorts of other things. And that just really resonated with me. So maybe the, maybe the thought there is fo just following your instincts um, as a writer. I, uh, when I was first starting out, I, I, this works for a lot of people, but it wasn't, it didn't work for me. I did a lot of plot pointing and mapping out things and wall looking like a serial killer, <laughs> trying to kind of pre-plan it all out. But I actually think it's the more kind of the listening to the instinct um, that has been more helpful for me. So I think I think what I'd add to that is I mean what you've all, what you've said is so smart. Um, let the novel teach you. I think there's 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 something um, 
a kind of beginner's mind when you're in, in, in the middle of a novel where, it, where at a certain point, despite all your grand schemes, um, the novel becomes its own entity. The, te the characters start to teach you. They do things that you hadn't planned on and you have to sort of make those battlefield decisions in the middle of, do you follow them? Are they becoming more complex and interesting than you'd first thought? And that's always great. Um, and, you know, so much of writing a novel is the moment to moment battlefield decisions you're making within a scene, within a chapter, and then the thing becomes a whole. And something I've learned that um, has been incredibly painful and humbling every single time is when I think the book is done. It's not done. And it needs a couple more drafts. And as someone who reads a lot of, a lot of work in manuscript, um, I think there's a moment where as a writer, you're tired. You've, you've, you've given it everything it, you've got in your guts. And that is not necessarily the moment when the thing is done. It's the moment when you're tired. <laughs> and um, to know the difference between fatigue and completion is, is something um, to kind of hold, I think, with empathy and love, and maybe let, let the manuscript get cold and mm -hmm. then read it again. Before, before getting it off your desk. And that is, that's hard. Mm -hmm. That's really hard to do. I love that answer so much. Mm -hmm. So good. We're so tired now. Yeah, we're so tired. <laughs> I think it's like life, good life advice in it's general. It's good life advice. <laughs> are you tired or are you done? Are you tired or are you done? <laughs> I love all that, and uh, I think I wouldn't interfere too much with the first draft. Just let the story come, uh, let it emerge out of subconscious, so you can have some, so you have some viable to work with. But in subsequent draft, I will pass on a piece of advice that I got from someone I admired. Um, don't use symbols. <laughs> yeah. Just describe the people and the events. Commit to them and bring them live. Wow, okay, I should have taken notes. There was so much good stuff there. Um, I'm just gonna add my own, which is if you can make somebody feel something, that's your entire job as a novelist. Make them feel, you know? Okay. Um, and then I had this question, what paragraph or sentence are you very proud of? Can you share it with us and then tell us why you love this one? Oh, you look at me. All of anyone. <laughs> <laughs> anyone. Well, coming off of that, um, uh, how to choose your um, choose your darlings. <laughs> Kill the others. No, just kidding. I was barely 15 yet ancient, as old in some respects as I would ever be. I'd witnessed the Temblers roar and the city's burning. I'd lost one mother and maybe a second. At night, my dreams were of bright-eyed hookers and velvet-lined vaults of cash and a longing I couldn't name. The world, having been unmade, was being made new again. In that gold house, Pai, Tan, Lafang, why even Lona had to make it new. I think of us, our lives, their savor and spark, and all the ways we never could resist the three blind kings of want, stupidity, and brashness. The heart leaps, the head conjures, the soul yearns. Desire being the one renewable fuel we have on earth, here is how we burned. Hmm? The Three Kings. And what I like about that paragraph is sometimes, sometimes in the writing, um, if it's kind of moving through me, I write something and I pick up my head and go, yeah, that's what I think. You know, it's like it, it I didn't know it till I wrote it. And that was, um, some of those sentences came early on and some came later and that paragraph found its mm -hmm. moment through a lot of revisions. So um, I think that's why 
that strikes me. It's also sort of in the book. Thank you. I'd like to read a passage where Mrs. Hyde talks to uh, Ken Darling, and he tries to, con um, he's already on thin ground with uh, the Texan father because he lied to him. <laughs> so, uh, but here he wants to tell him some personal truth. So he says this in Chinese, and Jude, poor Jude, has to translate this into English. Mrs. Hyde, oh. You are a fabric store owner. I know an expert in textile weaves. Mrs. Hai showed Ken the cloth in his hand, feeling its familiar weight. See how the warp and the weft yarns are woven together. Chinese people think all things in nature are connected. In this light, a piece of cloth is analogous to a person's life. If your family nurtures you like warp yarns, your friends a lover may support you like web threads. One thread is nothing. Even a steel thread may be bent with my fingertips. Mrs. Hai tried to tear the curtain, but he only hurt his fingers. He went out with a shy smile. After the warp and web are woven together, the, clothes, the cloth becomes durable. A shirt on your back may last you a decade before it goes out of style. Mrs. Hai wrapped the curtain around his shoulders like a shawl. Imagine the resilience of a human fabric. It is well woven. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> thank you. So the metaphor emanates from the character in uh, Mrs. Hai's work. I feel it rings true to the character, and I've, he's very brave to finally speak his personal truth. Thank you for bringing. <laughs> I didn't bring my, I didn't bring my book, so Naomi gave me my own book, which was very nice. Look at all those dog-eared pages she's got. Isn't that great? That's actually that's so interesting. I went to read a paragraph and it's marked. Oh yay! It's flagged. Um, uh, the sort of working title of my book for a long time was "You Belong to Everyone," and uh, this is why. Telling someone else's story is easy. You focus on one detail and it sticks with people, makes the subject more memorable, more appealing. It is different when it comes to your own story. You can't see the thing that stands out, the quality that makes you different from every other person. You certainly feel different, but your perception of yourself is too skewed to count for anything. You can never know what it's like to talk to you what it's like to walk next to you, or what it feels like to touch you. You never really see yourself. You project your bits out into the world for everyone to collect like shells. You belong to everyone. Waiting is an exquisitely private pain. It's the events that broadcast the joy and the grief, concrete losses and triumphs that a group can huddle around. But waiting we must do alone. We must wait for the sorrow to pass, for the memories to dull, for the hard work to pay off, for the object of our longing to arrive or depart. At my office one afternoon, a woman confides in the bathroom that eventually her desire for a child just disappeared. The words wrap around me like wool, heating my neck and ears, and I wear them around for weeks, asking no one, does a thing like that really just leave you? Mm -hmm. um, I think there's, we talked a lot about stillness. I think there's actually a lot of um, stillness in the book. There's a lot of waiting and a lot of longing. And the, the narrator doesn't actually have um, a child in its pages, but I think in a lot of ways it's kind of a non-traditional motherhood book. Um, I think she's thinking a lot about the, the work physically and spiritually and emotionally that one can do in the process of waiting for a child or preparing for a child or hoping for a child. Um, 
and if that can be part of a, mer a, a motherhood narrative too. And so I think some of that passage get, speaks to that, which is why I like it. Thank you. Um, I have two more questions, and then we will turn it over to questions um, from the audience. Um, so maybe we'll do this one quickly. What, so it's sort of two-parter, but we can go quick. What for you are the occupational hazards of the writing life, and what are the joys of the literary life? You're never on vacation, and you're never on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Two things. <laughs> yeah, I think you're all. I think I think you're always listening. You're always so. So there's that outsiderness. There's this great word in Armenian, odar. It means outsider, and. I think, by definition, most writers are outsiders in the sense that you've always got one foot out of life observing it. And um, that's just a way of being. So it's not like you ever you can sort of check that at the door. You're always watching. Um. <laughs> um, did you want to speak to the joys, or should we do joys <laughs> after? <laughs> I love I love so, someone asked me recently in an interview, you know, like, what, why do you write? And I said, because I, like, since I was a little kid, I wanted to know what makes people tick. You can't ever solve it. And it's just, what makes people tick? Why do they do what they do? Um, <laughs> that's the joy for me. It's just kind of noodling on that all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say, so I, I didn't start writing fiction until I was in my 40s, um, so I was reading for, you know, decades before I started writing fiction. And so I would say one of the occupational hazards, it, it has changed the way I read. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that's great, and sometimes it's annoying, because I will be reading and then all of a sudden I'll sort of step out of the story and think mm -hmm. about, like, how did the writer do this? Or, oh, that's interesting that they started in present tense and then moved to past tense, and it's from this character's perspective. And so I'll sort of, like, step out of the story and look at it structurally, and sometimes um, I can learn a lot from that, and sometimes it's annoying because I just want to read a good story. <laughs> um, and uh, the joys, I mean, for me, it's been really life-changing coming into fiction. It feels like finally I have a place to put things. So um, I'm constantly taking notes and noticing details and now having a place, you know, I've been doing that my whole life and now having a place to actually um, put those is just uh, the same reason why I like to go to the container store. <laughs> It's a pleasant brain feeling when something fits perfectly into another thing. And now that is happening in my brain, and uh, it's like I needed this my whole life and didn't know it, and now things fit better. I feel there's just a lot of stumbling blocks for me to become a writer. Because um, I work as an engineer, I only right on the weekend and holidays. It's just so hard to juggle a day job, family, and writing. I can only allocate a, a little myself to each role, and I have to reckon with my limitations um, and I constantly feel guilty about it. But there are many joys of, of writing life. I get to meet amazing writers who are sitting here as well tell truth that I don't hear elsewhere. For me, a literary life, even a part-time one, is extraordinarily fulfilling because I can remain true to myself as a writer. Um, I feel free and I dare to risk everything when I sit down just to write a story. I, I really love that answer so much. That's a hard one to follow. Um, I think if uh, alongside a lot of what's been said around just the time and, and money, um, if I'm being most honest, I think the the feeling of having written and the feeling of uh, more to more to write is the joy and the sadness um, for me. It's both things. It feels tremendously good to to sit down and know that that's coming, um, and and to have written something, um, but there's also a sadness in letting it go. Um, 
and there's a sadness to go back to the desk and, and kind of face that again. So I think, I think it's both of those things. Yeah. Wow, beautiful. Um, so the final question, this is from the Proust questionnaire. You're having a dinner party, there are four guests that are alive, no family or friends, who are you inviting? And bonus question, what are you serving? <laughs> I, my beautiful teenage daughters are here, and I was talking to them about this this morning when we were having French toast, and I was thinking, this, I don't even know how to answer this question because sometimes I don't want to meet um, people I am obsessed with because it's too nerve-wracking. Like, okay, best version of them. Um, <laughs> but then I said the only person I could come up with, and like celebrity-wise, is Bjork. Um, the wonderful Icelandic singer. And so my daughter said, just say Bjork. And I said, but that's only one person. <laughs> and so I decided that I would like to have a dinner party with Bjork in different like iterations of her life. So like Sugar Cubes Bjork, and then like debut album Bjork, <laughs> and then like Vespertine Bjork, and then she's going on tour, so like now. So just like different Bjorks around the table. Um, and what I would serve, I, I haven't been able to stomach spicy food this year, which has been a real bummer about cancer. Um, so I can't wait till I can have spicy food again, but right now I would cook something like a cheesy pasta with like a fried egg on top. <laughs> I decided to pick four writers, being the nerd that I am. <laughs> So uh, my first guest will be George Eliot. Mm -hmm. I want to hear her talk about things she loves, uh, people who interest her, and watch her face light up. Mm -hmm. uh, my second guest is Eileen Chan. She's a 20th century Chinese writer who writes the purest, dark, and devastating love stories. And I want to ask her, how can she write a love story in a world that's falling to pieces? Next, I will invite um, Jhumpa Lahiri and Elena Frante. Uh, when it's nice, the other is bold. They will have an interesting conversation. <laughs> if they speak Italian, I can't understand it. <laughs> I just watch their face, and uh, I think I'll, I'll enjoy watching them. <laughs> I'll serve uh, pasta and Chinese braised noodles, mm. raviolis and dumplings. I let them try a little bit of everything, um, the Western and Eastern versions of the same foods <laughs> before going on dessert. Mm -hmm. Sounds delicious. Yeah. It's, 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 it, yeah. it's a tricky question. It, it, Toni Morrison had a great line. She said, you have to love your characters. That doesn't mean you necessarily want to have dinner with them. <laughs> and it's true about writers, too. You know, my first hit was like, I'd love to have dinner with Tolstoy, but what if you got the bearded <laughs> hiding out in the train yeah. station Tolstoy? Like, what if you summoned the wrong Tolstoy, you know? So, so I think to answer the question, it's like, who would, who's, who's great at a dinner party? Mm -hmm. Like, who's a great conversationalist? So, uh, James Baldwin, like, yeah. can you imagine? Can you imagine what he would just say while he's passing the salt? Um, Jane Austen. Um, uh, Virginia Woolf, who might be a little crusty though at a dinner party. <laughs> yeah. Think about it. She might be, you know. Um, and then one of, uh, then I'd probably throw in James Salter, who's was I'd, I'd had many dinners with, and was one of the most interesting people I've ever known. Mm -hmm. So um, that'd be interesting. And I would serve them Armenian, a whole Armenian spread that would make my grandmother and up, up in the clouds be very happy. Mm -hmm. uh, this year I read a memoir by a Danish writer, uh, Tova Ditlevsen, called the Copenhagen Trilogy. And it's one of the most kind of extraordinary things I've ever read. Um, she, she died in the 70s, but so I, I, would, I would pick Tova. Um, mm. Yeah. Love her. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm jealous of your Ferrante answer now because now I would know her identity. Um, but I, I was thinking um, Alice Monroe, um, I, because 
because um, Grace Paley. Yeah. yeah. And I read a lot of uh, bell hooks, actually, while I was writing the novel. Um, brilliant writer and critic. And I'd be really curious to hear more from her. Um, I, I would have to sort of take out because I'm a terrible cook and they would never want to come <laughs> back over again if I prepared something for them. So. Oh, that was amazing. That's, um, that's it for us. We're going to take questions from you. Thank you so much. Don't be shy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm curious about um, if who you show your work to, if anybody, and how relevant it, and how do you choose who to show your work to? Can, can everyone hear the question? Are you um, I show my husband is my first reader and very honest reader and able to be very uh, critical in a way that I find very comforting somehow. <laughs> um, so I show it to, I show, yeah, I show stuff to him. And then um, I have a couple of writer friends who I will show work to. And if, uh, like for example, there's a chapter in this novel um, uh, at a therapy session and I happen to have a friend who is a professional therapist and so I showed her that chapter before like sometimes I will go to someone who's you know um, has like a similar occupation or mindset to a character in a book to sort of double check um, but yeah I would say besides that and then eventually it gets to my agent but um, yeah just a couple of people I don't I don't spread it too far around My first reader is also my husband, because <laughs> he's very critical, and he's not a writer, <laughs> so uh, he's you know, doesn't mince words at all. <laughs> he has a sense of reality, very grounded. Are we married to the same person? <laughs> <laughs> I imagine more writers. <laughs> they show the um, you know, trusted non-writer. And I have a few writer friends that I used to be in a workshop with. Then I went to a writer's conference, sometimes agent, um, with each book is a little bit different. <laughs> uh, when I was in the MFA, I feel like I had a very kind of wide circle, of a, a big feedback loop. And then after that, it became very, very small. So um, surprisingly, it's similar. My, it's my husband, who's also an editor and a publisher. Um, Poor soul had probably had to read this book about 10,000 times <laughs> over the course of seven years. And it has my uh, feedback group has gotten slightly bigger um, over the last year or so, but it, it's it's mainly him. I'm going to add that my, my first reader is also my husband. These poor husbands. Oh, my God. Um, and at this point, I'm working on a third book, and he has asked me to not show it to him. He's read early drafts. He's like, can I please read this one when it's done? So, you know, if it's really bad, it's his fault. <laughs> Well, it's unanimous. My, my husband is my first reader. So I, I, I wait a really long time to show him anything. He's also a, a brilliant editor. And um, so he's, he's, he's fierce and mm -hmm. hardest. Uh, he's much nicer to every other writer he has <laughs> to me. But I really love that and trust it. But sometimes we've worked it out after decades of being together that when we read each other, we say, OK, who am I right now? Am I an editor or am I your husband? Mm. Um, and, and I always want the editor, but I also want the husband. So we, we partition, like, OK, I'll be your husband right now and now. Um, and that's helpful so that I don't hate him for a couple of minutes. <laughs> there was one in the back. Like, every time I try to write fiction, 
being creative and like pulling in things that you maybe don't know or that you've like, researched and making that feel authentic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't believe in the right what you know. I, I think that's, I think we should throw that one away. I think um, what I try to tell um, writers who are, who are growing into it and, and working on the stuff is write what you want to know. But, but be mindful of what are the urgent questions in your life that are driving your fiction. The, the sooner you can get in touch with that, of what, what, what is really moving through um, the story for you? What's at stake for you? And I think a better measure, or if it's more helpful for me, um, is write what makes your heart beat because you're afraid. Um, go to the fear, go to the place that feels most risky and hold still. I cannot agree more. Uh, that was beautiful. And we fiction writers want to write about what we want to know, otherwise we'll be writing memoirs, right? And I also find it's very limiting just to write about what you what you know, and uh, it's actually uh, debilitating. So I have a little trick. I just moved the town to a different city, uh, like for my story collection, my old faithful. Um, I, I write about family that I'm not intimate about, but I moved the town to a city I barely visited mm -hmm. and implant them to uh, a strange environment. So I have to build this story from ground up, psychologically. It just frees me from the, the real things, and I can start to create. Yeah, I would just add to that by saying, I think, um, think about the version of the truth that you're interested in, because fiction is really good at getting at, at kind of deeper truths than, than real life descriptions might always get to. Um, I, I grew up in a transracial adoptive home, and so many times I, I get asked, well, why didn't you just write the novel as a memoir? And the answer is, though there are a lot, some details in here, of course, taken from my life, but the, the real story isn't actually the truth I was interested in. I wanted to be able to explore all these other things with, with a little bit more grit. And so I think, uh, yeah, fiction allows you to kind of take it there. Um. One like practical point addressing your question is I've been in that situation too where I start to write a story or something and then I realize, oh, this is, I'm just like writing a nonfiction piece. Um, so one thing that I do that might be helpful is to make like really um, uh, deliberate um, choices to make the character very different from you. And sometimes it's fun to do a little writing exercise where you um, have like really strong opinions about random things, so like um, this character, you know, hates it when there's a piece of paper on the floor, like how dare there be paper on the floor, you know, paper is precious, and um, I never use black pens, I only use red pens because of these, like make, just make a list of very strong opinions that are not your own opinions, and then I find that that helps mold a character to be very different from myself. Um, and then this book was very loosely inspired by my own experience. My father had Alzheimer's, um, and I learned a lot through you know, helping care for him and certainly use that information in the book. But I made, and so sort of like Ashley, some people ask, you know, why didn't you just write a memoir about having a father with Alzheimer's? And to me, that's not, I mean, I love reading memoir, but I had no interest in writing about my own story. Um, so I did, in the same way, make very deliberate choices about making the family very different from my own, making the character very, very different from who I am as a person. Um, and yeah, but I agree, like writing, I don't know, and especially this time we're at a very you know, tricky time, as we all know, about like people feel, some people feel very strongly about only writing, sort of stay in your lane and kind of writing from your own culture and your own perspective. Um, and I think like, uh, yeah, I, I really want to explore other cultures. I'm an anthropology geek. I love learning about other cultures. I love learning about other people. But I do think uh, we have a responsibility to uh, like fact check very deeply and wisely <laughs> and talk to people who are from that culture and make sure that we're respecting the characters. But I think if you come at fiction with a really respectable um, and a respectful 
point of view, you can write people who are not like you at all. So I would certainly encourage everyone to try that and be brave and also be smart and talk to other people and make sure that you are um, writing it from a smart perspective and not a stereotypical one because no one wants to read that. So. Yeah, I think we are, um, should we do one more question since we started sure. a little late? Okay. Uh, I'm curious what your editing process looks like. Uh, like, what are the critical lenses you're applying to like, how your plot should change or how your characters might change? So the question was editing? I missed, I couldn't yeah. hear um, all of it. You're, you're curious process. about how the editing process works? Uh, yeah, just how you edit the novel. Um, I've, I've said this before, uh, but, um, I consider myself like as much of a sculptor as a writer. Um, I, I, my writing style is very uh, particular, I would say, and concise. Um, and I want every word to be important and every sentence to matter. And so when I write, I tend to write a lot and then carve it. So um, I slice a whole, a whole bunch off. This book was originally um, almost twice the size and I just went through and sliced and sliced and sliced and sliced until I had, like I just, did, that's just, again, maybe it's the container store, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I want everything to uh, matter very deeply and every word to matter. So um, my editing process is a lot of uh, deletion, basically. <laughs> a lot of slicing and dicing. Yeah, and I knew I found the right publisher when um, the editor there suggested, and, it, and it's a very small novel, and the editor suggested that I cut one chapter, and I thought, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna be a good team. <laughs> Although we're gonna have like 10 pages left at the end of the process, so we better be careful, but yeah. So a lot of uh, deletion. <laughs> I would agree with that. I feel like I heard a writer describe the revision process once as kind of like accordion-like thing where you're, mm -hmm. you're writing and you're carving down and writing and carving down. Um, I think later in the process, having other people look at it is also helpful in, in the deleting. So you're like, well, that was great. What are you talking about? Yeah. Like, oh, later, you realize what's 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 helpful to go. So, yeah, I'm gonna say something too. I, you know, what I usually do is I try to generate about 400 pages, and it can be really bad. It can be garbage. It can not be. Uh, it might not be consecutive. It might be a big mess. And then I spend many many years getting that in order. What that means is like moving things, cutting things, putting it in a flow. And you know, my first book took 10 years, second took six, that this one is taking six also. It's just painstaking editing. I mean, editing is probably more important than writing. You know, what ends up in the novel is 20 to 30% of what the entire project was. Also, I mean, imagine if you spend five years and you gather all your best thoughts of five years, you're going to sound so much smarter, right? <laughs> so just think about it like that. You're, um, you're condensing and making it like a diamond. You're not just spewing all this stuff. I agree with all that. Um, with this book, I learned something new about editing. It's called development edits with the editors. Um, with my other books, I just did uh, limited um, line editing <laughs> for my final drafts. But development edit was, okay, um, I think there are three stages of writing. When you first conceive a story, you kind of like put on foundation, build a house from the ground up. Then you put in the rooms, the floors, the walls, and those work feels very productive, it make you feel strong, and you feel, you feel good at the end of the day. It's, it's, accomplish a lot. But at the development stage, it's not like building a house. You're actually like doing surgery. <laughs> you try to bring all these, make a connection of all these things, and refine the metaphor, and you tune the timing of things, and cut away the fat, and of course, I agree with a lot of cutting. But this work, it doesn't always feel very productive, you know? At a certain point, it feels like mm -hmm. you have diminishing returns. Mm -hmm. And to, even to the point that I might work, make it worse, I might doing too much of this. But it's also very important. Um, you have to 
for people, you know, to get published, you have to push through the last stage, and that could be very painful. And you need to have good editors hold your hand. So it is a long, arduous journey, <laughs> and there, there are stages. I think the only thing I'd add, and I love that sculptor idea. It also, for me, sometimes feels like I'm in a music studio with all those buttons at a certain point, like. <laughs> figure out the modulation of, of all the characters, all the storylines, is are things is everything moving on the on on the right track? Who you know, there was this great line that William Maxwell said when he was writing um, one of his later books. He said he began every day asking himself, um, who haven't we heard from lately? And that's very helpful for me in the editing process. Like, it, it just, am I moving? It, it, it finally, are, it, am, are, is the reader tracking everybody and, and moving? And while we haven't heard that character, is, is that character's story moving forward? So the next time we see him or her, they've, the, the story's advanced, their story's advanced. Um, the, other, the other line that haunts me and I'm gonna bastardize it, so forgive me, but bringing back old bearded Tolstoy, he said, um, he said, only when you get high enough on the scaffolding to not be able to change, when, and it's too late to change anything, can you see the book you've made? Um, and that's so true. So um, in the beginning, it's really important, like what posts you put deep in the ground, because you're gonna have to live with them down the road, and I've, Sometimes, like midstream, do you, are we all like, <laughs> it's like, um, you know, like really be careful what, what you've what you've mapped out for yourself, and and at the end that you're working with that. I think that's all we have time for. But thank you, everyone. Thank you.